I think at the heart of the Christian life is one question, and there's other questions, but there there is this this core question that determines your whole Christian experience, and I think it's this. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God loves you? Because how you answer that question determines so much about your faith and your walk and your life and how you feel and how you look at the world. Do you believe that God loves you? And not do you believe that God exists or do you believe that God is love or what does the Bible say about God? Those are not the question. The question that makes all the difference is, do you believe that God loves you? The Apostle Paul wrote the letter, of the, the letter to the Ephesians, which was a group of churches who were struggling, at least in some part, with this question. Because he spends a lot of time talking about the love and the glory and the grace of God. And that, that makes sense to me, because the pagan relationship that they would have had to their pantheon of gods wasn't a relationship based on love. It was actually a transactional kind of thing. In fact, Christianity is unique in that it is a relationship with God. It is a, it is a religion that is founded on the idea that God loves us. And so the, these pagan Greeks and Romans, they would have brought a, a sacrifice to their God or done a ritual or said a prayer or whatever in the hopes that they would get some kind of return. Like, I'll do this for you, and you give me what I ask for. And it was mostly just a cold and sterile kind of thing. In fact, sometimes in these ancient religions, we see that there was sort of an animosity between God and the people, like they, or the gods and the people, that there was sort of a, a mutual disrespect and kind of a mutual fear. And it was just purely transaction. There wasn't a lot of warmth or love, usually. But the true God, the God who the Bible describes, is not like little g gods. He is love. That's what John tells us. And he loves his people and he wants them to know his love for them and to feel it and to experience it and to live in the light and the warmth of his presence. That's what we're going to talk about today, the love of God. Let's read this together. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Here's the main idea today. God wants to dwell in our hearts so that we may know the depth of his love. Let me say it again. God wants to dwell in our hearts so that we may know the depth of his love. So that we may know the depth of his love. And there's more in there. We're going to unpack all this. But I think that is the, that's the key idea that is holding all of this together. He begins verse 14 by saying, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And, and what we're going to see here is that this whole thing essentially is, is a recounting of his prayers for the Ephesian church. And by extension, his, his prayers for us. The Apostle Paul was praying for these churches that these things, these three things would be true. And it says he bows his knees before the Father, the Father. Again, not just a Father or a God or a cultural God or anything like this. This is the Father, the one from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. Which is an interesting appeal, and it makes more sense here in the context because he's just gotten done talking about the, the Jews and the Greeks and how Jews and Gentiles are now all one family of God. So he says, that same Father, who is now the Father of us all, I'm praying to him, and I'm asking these three things. The first one is this. He's praying that we would experience the presence of Christ in our hearts. 
That's number one, that we would experience the presence of Christ in our hearts, that we would experience the presence. Verse 16, he says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Which is kind of an interesting sentence. Let's, let's break this down. He asked that we would be strengthened with power, which that makes sense. The word strengthened here is kratiao in Greek, which literally means to, to make strong. It's exactly what you think. To, to reinforce or to strengthen something. And he wants us to be reinforced with his power. Which the idea here being, though, should be not with his power, with power. God is going to be doing the strengthening, but he wants to strengthen us with power. And that word power is not power in the sense of a power plant. It's, it's this idea of ability. That he wants us to be able to be able, to be strengthened, to be able to experience the dwelling of Christ in our hearts. And he says that this happens through his spirit and it happens in our inner being. So the strength he's asking for is not, is not for a physical strength or a mental strength, but for a spiritual strength, the strength that is in our souls. Because human beings, according to scripture, have two parts. We might say we're body and soul, or we're flesh and spirit. We are outer self and inner self. And both of those are who we are. And so what he's asking is that our inner selves would be strengthened. And if the strengthening doesn't happen because we want it to or because we will it to be or anything like that, it happens by the power of God. It says it's according to the riches of his glory, riches that are vast and immeasurable, so far beyond us that we can't grasp them or really understand them. That's what Ephesians 3.8 said that we discussed a few weeks ago. He says that the, the unsearchable riches of Christ is what he was preaching unsearchable riches. We said that, that that's, God has a level of riches in his glory that can't be measured or quantified, that he is just glorious beyond measure. And so he asks, the apostle is asking that we would be spiritually strengthened by the immeasurable power of God, something that only God can do by the spirit who lives in us. It's like, like asking God to charge the battery of our souls with his divine lightning so that we would be new and have a new supernatural capability for the purpose of knowing Christ, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. That the purpose of the spiritual strengthening that he's asking for is not so that we could do good things or that we might be able to pray better or to endure suffering better, or to preach the gospel, although all of those things matter. But he says it's so that we might know and experience the real and powerful presence of Christ in our hearts. And that we might have this loving relationship of trust with God Almighty, who now dwells in us like he used to dwell in the temple. And I want to just, uh, I talk about this a lot because it, it really... It's a very important context of understanding what it is that God dwells in us and that his glory would come and dwell in us and his presence would dwell in us. Because that is something that the Old Testament Israelites could only dream of. Exodus is is all about the people of God coming out of Egypt, being formed as a nation, and then God coming to dwell in their midst. And what God did multiple different times was to show himself to his people. And the way that he decided to do that uh, most concretely was the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the special huge tent that was built with all these to all these amazing specifications, this ornate thing that they would set in the middle of their massive camp and the cloud of God's glory would come and rest on it. And Moses before that had gone up to the mountain to meet with God and essentially he, he receives all the law And all of these things and all these instructions. And he says to God, please show me your glory. Like, I I want to see this. Because the Israelites had almost rejected God. He had come down on the mountain and trumpeted his glory to them. And given them the Ten Commandments by the word of his own mouth. And they said, please don't do that again. But Moses goes up and he says, I want more. Show me your glory. 
And so God says this to him in Exodus 33, 19. He says, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I'll show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I'll take away my hand and you'll see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And so Moses gets more than he asked for, really. I don't think he understood exactly what he was asking of God. Show me your glory. The immeasurable riches of God's glory would have killed him. And God says, I'll give you a glimpse of my back. And then verse, me, chapter 34, he comes back down the mountain. And says, when he came down with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down, he did not know that the skin of his face was shining because he'd been talking with God. And Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. And they made him put a veil over his face because it was so bright it was uncomfortable to look at him because he had just been in the presence of God. And then chapter 40, they finish the tabernacle. They consecrate it. And it says, The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And not even Moses was able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That this presence and glory of God that filled the tabernacle now has come to live in us. That, that is the literal implication of what, of what he's saying here. And that's the idea of the New Testament. That we have become the temple of God and that the glory of God has come to rest in us. And Moses says you need to be strengthened spiritually to be able to handle the presence of Christ that he wants to show you and to give you and for you to experience. That God has welcomed us in, so to speak, to his presence and his glory and we get to know him and so that's what the apostle prays that we would experience the presence of christ in our hearts and he says that that comes through faith that that comes through faith that that's the thing like it's not that we prepare ourselves and then god comes to rest i don't know he says we we trust in him we're gonna get into that here in just a second Here's number two, the next thing that he asks. Very related, but slightly different. He asks for us that we would be able to know the unknowable love of God. That we would be able to know the unknowable love of God. To know the unknowable. Verse 17 continues, says that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And obviously those two things go together. The presence of Christ and the love of Christ, you can't tear those apart. Those go together. Because the love of Christ and the glorious presence of Christ go hand in hand. And so he says we have to be rooted and grounded in love. And those two words, rooted and grounded, are both about foundations. This idea that we have to be built and sustained by and attached to the love of God if we're ever going to know Him. That the base and the core of our life should be the love of God. And the fact and the reality that God loves us. And, and I think that, that that is the foundation of our faith in general. Because remember that Christian faith isn't just belief in the unseen or hope that God exists or pretending that maybe there's something bigger than us. That is not what faith is. The world thinks that's what faith is. The faith is believing things that you know aren't true. Like that's not right though. Biblical faith is, is a certainty that God exists. Like I, I have no doubt that God exists. The question is, do I believe that God is good? Do I believe that he is who he says he is? Do I trust him? That's biblical faith, that he's going to do what he says he'll do. Do I believe that? And that he actually truly loves me. Because the Bible is clear that God loves us to the point that he gave his son for us. Romans 5.8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That while we still hated God, that while we were still his enemies, Jesus came, died in our place to redeem us from the curse of sin. 
And in some very real sense, the content of my faith has to be God loves me. And that he really actually does. Because it's on that basis that we said in verse 17 that Christ comes to dwell in our hearts. That, that it's faith that brings him in. And that presence of Christ and that love of God should become the firm foundation for our lives. And it's from that place of believing and knowing and trusting in the love of God that we gain the spiritual strength to be able to be inhabited by the Spirit of Christ and to enter into the holiest place and behold the glory of God. And it's from that place then that we grow in our comprehension of God's love. He says, I want you to be strengthened and I want you to be rooted and grounded in love so that you can comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Because what we're talking about when we talk about the love of God is something that is immeasurable. It's immeasurable. And I think if we're not careful, sometimes in our our branch of Christianity, we can get so caught up in in small details of theology, things that matter, that we often forget that God loves us. So we get so caught up in sanctification, trying to live holy lives, again, which matters immensely, that we forget that the foundation of our faith and our salvation is God's grace and love for us. A love that doesn't end. Imagine being the first guy to ever want to measure the ocean. Because we don't know who that guy was, but there, there was somebody out there who began... That, that task that we still haven't finished, by the way. The ocean is something that we haven't measured. We haven't seen it all. We don't really know what is beneath so much of the ocean. But there was, there was some guy, there's always a first, who was just standing on the ocean shore without a computer or an instrument or even knowing what those things were, who had no vehicles or anything, and just wondering, how big is this ocean? How big is the ocean? Because maybe you've experienced that, where you stand on the ocean shore and you look out. You can't see it end this way. You can't see it end this way. You can't see it end that way. You just, it's just there. And, and you know this is where it starts, but I don't know where it ends. And you could put some of it in a bucket, and you wouldn't have even begun to measure how deep and vast the ocean is. And that is the love of God for us. That's what he's saying. He says that with God's help, with the strength that the Spirit provides, we might possibly vaguely, drop by drop, begin to maybe understand a little bit of the love of God for us. Because it's wider than the ocean. And it's higher than the sky. Psalm 36.5 says, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Which again, if you've ever been on an airplane, maybe you, you take for granted that we get to touch the clouds now, so to speak. We can go above that. But in the days of the people writing the Bible, the, the thought that you could even get close to the clouds, you'd have to climb the highest mountain to be able to touch the clouds. And he says, that's how high the love of God is. And so the, this idea that the ocean stretches out, the mountains rise high. Maybe you've had that experience of just being overwhelmed, maybe by the ocean or by something else. In nature. How about the night sky? Have you ever seen the night sky? Which they would have been surrounded by in those days. Because we have so much light pollution. We have these city lights everywhere. You look up here. You can see a few stars. We're a little further out. When you really go. Like if you just keep going. Keep going west. You get to a point where there aren't lights anymore. Where there's just all those Texas prairies. And you can look up and you see a different sky. And if you're not ready for it, it can just overwhelm you because you see these galaxies painted across the background of a million stars. And the love of God for us is wider and higher and more vast than that. Or the mountains. Like the mountains can be overwhelming. Just this week, I was in Wyoming. I had to see some breathtaking mountains. I wasn't ready. I was not ready for that view. And it just is, you realize... I'm so small, and these mountains are so high. I couldn't, there are places on those mountains that I couldn't imagine, I couldn't get to if I wanted to. And the love of God is wider and broader and higher than that. It's greater than we can imagine. And that God would even create us in the first place. 
And then after sin, that he would spare us and make his patience wait. And that he would take on the likeness of sinful flesh and stand in for us on the cross. And that he would give his life for our lives. And so that we who have rejected and wronged him might not get the wrath that we deserve. That is the love of God for you. John 3.16, the one that we all know, says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And you and I will spend an eternity grasping at the love of God. And we will drink our fill and there will be more and more to take its place. That is how deep and wide and broad God's love is. And he says, I'm praying for you that you may be able to know, to comprehend, to understand, to grasp the thing that can't be grasped and to know the thing that can't be known, which is the width of God's love for you. A love that you can't out sin and a love that you can't run away from and a love that you can't you can't escape its presence. And here's the third thing that he, he asks for us, which is crazier still, that we would be full of God. That we would be full of God. That's number three, that we would be full of God. He says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Which again is only slightly different from the presence of Christ. It's the the, the fullness of God. The presence of Christ is the fullness of God. But just this phrase is just so crazy to me. He wants us to know the unknowable depth of God's love. To experience that. To experience the presence of Christ who upholds the universe by the word of his power. And then he says that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Because this phrase is just so surprising and so personal. And to me, at least, it's, this is a hopeful phrase. That God wants to fill us full with himself. And that we who once were God's enemies have not only been reconciled to God, but that God wants to have a relationship with us where we are filled with his fullness. And now again here, we're grasping at something that defies understanding. Because firstly, God doesn't have a body. God doesn't have volume. God can't be measured. What even is the fullness of God? Because God can't be contained. Right? If you brought me a two-pound steak, on a good day, I might could get through that. If you brought me a five-pound steak, no chance. If you bring me a cow and said, eat this, I can't. That's not, it's not even a possibility. And God says he wants to fill us with his fullness. So what does that even mean? It's, it's a mystery. That, that's what it is. It's a mystery. But it can only be good because God is good. And whatever God is, that's what what we want. And God wants that for us. And it represents, I think, this kind of unity between us and God. the, The consummation of God reconciling us to himself. Where God increases while we decrease and we get more and more of the greatest thing that exists. And it also, this is crazy because we are so finite. right? Our souls and our bodies are so small in comparison to God. How could we ever be filled with his fullness without bursting and being done? Right? That's what God tells Moses. You'll die. If I give you my glory, you'll die. And yet that's what God has, is offering to us. That he's going to strengthen us by his spirit so that we might be ready and able to experience the fullness of God. And if all of this sounds just kind of weird or new agey, just bear with me because... What I'm trying to explain here is something that we can't really explain. It's something that we can experience in part. And it's, and it's great. It's the, God is the best thing. And I think maybe this is what the mystics were trying to get to. The, the guys in the, even still today, people who are trying to have these ecstatic experiences where I just want to, I want the anointing. I want to be filled with God. I want to I see him. That is a good desire. It's a right thing. The problem is that if you go about it in the wrong way, you end up in a weird place. Because so many of the mystics were willing to put aside their minds in search of a feeling. But we are not called to do that. In fact, Jesus tells us that God wants to fill more than just our emotions. He wants to fill our minds as well. And that this pursuit of loving God 
and being loved by God is every facet of our being. Mark 12, 30. Jesus says, the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's, that's your, your, the core of your being. With all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But these different facets that make us, God wants us to love him with all of that. Not just one, not just with the heart, and not just with the mind, and not just with the strength, but all of it. That's how we become filled with the fullness of God, is that we experience him with every facet of who we are. And so we see God not just in those ecstatic experiences, but through his word and through prayer. And we use our minds and our hearts and our strength that as we physically do good things for one another, we experience more and more of that fullness of God, that as we obey him, as we carry out his commands, that's our loving God with our strength. When we turn our hearts toward him and we fill our minds with reason and logic and knowledge and we seek to know him not just to feel him but to know him then we become full of the fullness of god this mystery becomes more and more real for us and here's the greatest promise of all and it's implied by verse 20 that god will do these things for everyone who seeks him That's the last blank there. God will do these things for everyone who seeks him, who seeks him. Everyone who seeks him. He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God wants to fill us with his fullness. For everyone who seeks him, God wants to fill them with his fullness because God loves us. And he wants that so that we might know his unknowable love and grasp his ungraspable grace and see his glory. Luke 11, 9 through 13, Jesus says, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Matthew records this a little differently. and says, how much will the heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him. But Luke has a different focus. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And what we forget, I think, so often, because we get caught up, we live in this world, right? We have bodies of flesh. We have needs, physical needs. And we we experience pain and suffering and sorrow. We lose things that we love. And we lose jobs and family members and purpose. and, And we get sick. And we ask for those things, and those things are good and right. We should ask him for whatever we need. But God stands ready to give you himself. Himself. And that is the that is the treasure. That is the treasure of that is the that is the treasure, not just the treasure of the Christian life. God is the treasure. He his glory is better than life. David says, better is a thousand, excuse me, better is a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Like I just, we just want to be, we should want to be in the presence of God. And God says, I'm here. And so this morning, I want to come back to that question that we began with. The Bible is clear that God loves us. But the question is, do you believe that God loves you? Have you staked and built your life on the love of God for you? Because when all that stuff happens, when life happens, just kicks you in the face. If you believe God loves me, it just changes everything. That becomes the thing that roots us. It becomes the foundation of our lives. We become like the people built on the rock and not the sand. And nothing can knock us down. And even though we might suffer in this life and even though we lose and even though we, we feel the pain of loss and the pain of everything else that's happening and we... We have to dig deep and do things we don't want to do 
And we have to obey God when it's hard. If we are grounded and rooted on the love of God for us in Christ, then we can. And if we're not, then we can't. We can't. Because at the end of the day, God does love you. God loves us. He is love. And so, that's my encouragement to you this morning. Believe that he loves you. And again, I know that I know what that that sounds like. I don't I don't know, like a, you know, oh, believe in God's love, but do you believe that God loves you because he does? He does. He's here. Jesus came and died to reconcile us to God. And that reconciling means that we get to jump into the deep end of the love of God and be surrounded by him and filled with his presence at all times to the point that we just burst with the love and the fullness and the glory of God. And that's what we get invited into. And we just, we get so distracted by everything else. And God says, just, I love you. Come and, come and be with me. Root yourself in me. Seek me. Don't. Distract yourself with this world. Seek me and I'll give you more of what you really want. And that's God. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for your unsearchable and unknowable love that is deep and wide and vast beyond the ocean, beyond the stars, higher than the mountains, deeper than the deepest valley that you are with us, that you care about us, that before we even knew what love was, you loved us in Christ. Lord, we ask this morning that you would open our eyes to see and to savor and to experience the presence of Christ in our hearts. Lord, if there's anyone here today who is far from you, I ask that you would open their eyes to see their need for a Savior, to be rescued from their sins, but more than that, to, to know you, Lord, any, any of us here who are distracted, maybe all of us here who are distracted by the things of this world, would open our eyes to see that you are inviting us in to you, that we get to know you, and that you surround us and fill us. And what else could we need? Lord, we, we want to know you. We ask that you would show us your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.